In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the current edition of the New Yorker magazine, there's a cartoon that has a picture of a man standing on a street corner holding a large sign that says, The end is nigh. And another man is approaching him and says, But what are your goals? It's an obvious riff on the, uh, the Occupy uh, Toronto, Occupy New York, Occupy Portland, what have you, uh, movement of this kind of tension between these two conversations that seem to be happening right now in our society, between the people who are identifying with those who are protesting what they perceive to be uh, an increasing amount of disparity between the wealthy and the poor, and those people who come back at those folks with, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, what is your proposal for change? What is it that you want to see different? But it's also, uh, I think, fits nicely with the two fundamental conversations that are happening about eschatology, which simply means the ultimate things, uh, the final things. What is it that we mean when we say the kingdom of God? The truth is there are actually two conversations happening. One which is characterized by that sign, the end is nigh, is characterized by the fierce urgency of a response to God's coming judgment and justice. And the other response is one about goals and transformation and about life as we have it now. Those are the two sorts of conversations that happen in eschatology. And sometimes they seem to be characterized by the difference between sort of a threat and a promise, perhaps. And the threat um, sometimes is perceived in our culture as a kind of uh, cosmic I told you so, or, or a vindication for those who have chosen the, the path of Christianity. But that's only sort of a, a negative frame. I think in a positive frame, it, it's, it's a set of, of ways of looking at the world which value God's justice. And, and God's ultimate vindication of those who have sought to be uh, righteous in their lives. It basically uh, is about ethics in a way. Um, what's interesting is that whether you, you put that in the frame of a kind of cosmic judgment of an end of the world sort of scenario, or whether you personalize it to an individual life and you consider that when you die you're going to face God's judgment, the theology is basically the same. And in both cases, it leads one toward a sort of separation between their kind of Christian life and the life they live in the world. Uh, it does sort of push one toward a bit of a kind of uh, disengagement from the world and a desire to kind of create a kind of pocket of holiness around oneself. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing necessarily. I'm just saying it's characteristic of that kind of extreme of that sort of theology. There's another theology, though, uh, inherent in, in the, the hope of the kingdom to come, which is one that emphasizes instead of God's justice, more perhaps God's, God's mercy or God's love. Um, so it, it's sort of the kingdom as promise. And in the kingdom as promise theology, instead of looking toward a future moment when God's kingdom is inaugurated by the, the coming of Jesus to judge the world, instead what you have is a notion of the kingdom breaking forth right now. The kingdom, in fact, has already started. At the moment that Jesus was incarnated as the word in the world, the kingdom of God was breaking forth. And this new reality was emerging, and that we are called to live into that. And folks that uh, believe in that sort of a theology look for those little springs of new life, those little shoots coming up out of the ground, and believe fundamentally that the world can be transformed by the engagement of the faithful with it. And this is where the whole social gospel movement comes from. All those who, in the name of Christ, seek to transform our social institutions, uh, those folks are following this kind of theology. And, of course, there is uh, no one who actually goes to one of those extremes or the other. Uh, I, I Very rarely do you encounter that. Most people in their Christian walk of faith actually combine those two ideas. So on the one hand, they attempt to transform their society around them, and they also attempt to kind of withdraw and create a notion of a kind of uh, Christian life that somehow separates them from others around them. Um, and just to make it a little more clear, you can look at, uh, at institutions, and you can, you can see this very clearly in certain communities of faith. Um, for example, if you look at uh, the Mennonites or the Brethren in Christ or, or some of those Reformed traditions, you can see very much that people will adopt a, a distinctive form of dress. They will uh, take on certain lifestyle choices about how they'll spend their money as a community or, or what's appropriate for members of that community to do as occupations. Um, often they might have like a very strong desire not to be engaged in the military or in other political institutions because they believe it takes them away from the kind of kingdom of God that they, they seek to, to create in their, in their small little spheres. And the opposite extreme is people who go so far in the social gospel movement that, that they, they really um, 
it, it, it's fascinating. And they might have a hard time saying the creeds, for example, because to say a confessional creed, like we do on Sundays often, you know, to confess God as, as, as king is, just doesn't quite feel right to them. They're much more comfortable serving in a soup kitchen or, or giving as a service to, to others. So that kind of sets up this dynamic of these two sorts of kingdoms. What's interesting is that from the story we have today and from others in the gospel, it's clear to us that for Jesus, this kind of distinction would be total nonsense. Uh, he would find this quite absurd. For him, the fierce urgency of God's justice and the, uh, the implications that that has for both an ethical life and a life that has some notion of, of prophetic about it, of otherness about it, uh, would, would, be, would be resolved. Would be resolved in that moment of the individual making a choice and confronting the, the promise of God. So because of that, uh, Jesus has this idea of the kingdom that we're kind of constantly faced with. And the question is, how do we respond to that promise? And it can very easily lead us toward one of those two responses I outlined before. Very easily. And I don't want to say that either one of them is bad, because they're not. They're both aspects of the same reality. But I want to say that the degree to which we can imagine ourselves into that kingdom reality, which is an exercise in imagination to some degree, the degree to which we can have a vibrant picture of that kingdom is the degree to which our response will be faithful in whatever calling God has called us to, whatever you know, that particular vocation of ours might be, whether it takes us in the direction of service or holiness of life or, or whatever it might be. So let's talk a bit about this kingdom of God. Uh, often we tend to consider it in a negative frame. We, we tend to think of it as an, as an anti-whatever it is we don't like about this world. Um, so people will look around and they'll say, you know, I really don't like this, uh, this business about uh, the, the injustice that exists with people being persecuted around the world for, for uh, unjust causes under dictatorships or whatever. So I imagine that in the kingdom of God, all the captives and those who are oppressed will be set free to, to live their lives of liberty. Nothing wrong with that view. But it sort of constrains us in a way. Whenever we sort of imagine the kingdom of God to be what we're not having now, we're always sort of creating a kingdom of God out of what we have now. And what God promises is something quite a bit larger. In fact, there is no way that we can possibly imagine this kingdom that God promises us. It is so much larger than any reality of which we are now a part. It is so much bigger than anything that we can possibly imagine. So, to give you an example of of what I mean, uh, consider um, the cedar tree. Uh, When you look at it as a seed, it would be almost impossible to imagine it as a tree. It would be almost impossible to imagine that thing flourishing into a little, little seedling and then bigger and bigger until it's something that's the size of a person, until it's something that is towering up and above us. But you probably could imagine that, right? Because you've seen a seed and you've seen a tree and you know that they're connected to each other. Ah, but the life of that tree is not contained simply in its physical form, in the, the large trunk and the bushy leaves. It's quite a bit larger than that. Does it not encompass also all the creatures that made their homes in that tree? Does it not include that swing that parents put on it so that their kid could play under it? Does it not include uh, the, the fragrant uh, leaves that fall in the fall, you know, that somebody had to rake up? And those are all part of the life of that tree, too. And could you have possibly imagined the life that that tree has after it passes away, when someone chops it down and carves it up into, into planks? Could you have imagined what that workshop smelled like, you know, that, that cedar smell in the air after the bandsaw has done its work? Or could you have possibly imagined the canoe that was made out of it, the children playing in it, the, the trips taken in the wilderness? Those are all part of the life of that tree, too. And that's how it is with the kingdom of God, that we might look at a person and think that we can imagine what God's promises and kingdom might be for them, but we are sorely underestimating the bounty of God. We are sorely underestimating the power of his promises. So when you see someone, no matter how uh, difficult their life might be, and you might think to yourself, the kingdom of God is for this person to be healed of whatever ailment they have or to find happiness or or love, that may be true. But I want to say that there's something even greater than that. There's a whole other reality of that person's life. The people that they've known, the people that they've touched, that they've loved, uh, perhaps if that person dies, they may just still exist in the community as a memory. And that memory may be told again and again and again. And we will never know the end of that person's life. And of course, since we believe in life after death, not only does that life sort of ripple out in the creation as we know it, but into a heavenly sphere that we can only imagine in our wildest dreams. In our wildest dreams. Uh, This week is the anniversary of Daphne Archer's death. 
uh, Daphne was a beloved member of this community, and she, she passed away uh, somewhat surprisingly about a year ago. And, you know, we, we remember her fondly, you know, and, and, and in fact, uh, you know, I still sometimes sort of sort of think of her. In fact, just, you know, earlier today I was doing um, the pictures on the, on the board, and I, I can't take her picture down, all right? And in a sense, I decided today, I thought, you know, she's really still part of this community. Uh, maybe not in the same form that she once was, in terms of physically being here to talk to us. And she did love to talk, God bless her. No, it's a new form. It's something else. It's, it's a memory of her blessings to us. And it's a confidence that we have that her life continues with all God's saints. That it continues forever and ever and ever. So when we do this exercise of imagining the kingdom of God and all the blessings that are there, that are possible in God's grace, what we do is in ourselves, we have a natural response to that. And we live into a new vocation, a new reality. We become better people. When we imagine God's kingdom, we become better people. So that's the thought that I want to leave you with, beloved, as we go forth today.